and welcome to the to the final session of the What Works Conference for 2022. Thank you all so much for three wonderful days. Uh, thank you to uh, my colleagues Michelle Nobel, who is going to speak in this session, uh, and Jen Lisi, uh, both at Ohio Wesleyan University. My colleague Alex Alderman here at Kenyon, uh, who together uh, we formed the program committee. My colleagues. Uh, uh, Eric Holdner and Ashley Butler at the CIP, who are also part of my team, who have made this so wonderfully successful. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, to uh, a collaborative grant from the Ohio Five and uh, Kenyon College's anti-racism uh, funds uh, for some financial support of this conference. Uh, with that house cleaning done, let me introduce, uh, we'll have three speakers in, uh, in this session. And we will start with uh, Louisa Berry. Did I say your name correctly? Is it? Yeah, Louisa yeah. Berry. That was great. Louisa Berry, uh, Associate Professor of Cooperative Education, Community Arts and Performance at Antioch College, and Kevin Magruder, Associate Professor of History at Antioch College, uh, speaking on Dialogue Across Difference, first year seminar. Thank you all. It's good to be here. Um, Kevin and I will um, present a little bit about the history of this course and um, a, a little more detail, and then we hope that we'll have a chance to answer questions um, and have a bit of a conversation about it. Um, so the, the course is entitled Dialogue Across Difference. It is designed as a first year seminar for all incoming students at Antioch College. Um, I wanted to just start by giving a, a very brief kind of history of how we came about creating the course. In, um, in 2017, um, we were um, really uh, kind of taking the pulse of the campus climate at Antioch, and um, there had been uh, a couple of acts of explicit racism on campus. Um, prior to that, that were very concerning. Um, and we were also hearing from our first year students that they sort of felt like there was an informal kind of hazing that would go on um, from when they would arrive on campus from upperclassmen, particularly kind of about what were the expectations of um, behavior, but also um, sort of, you know, what to say and what not to say um, at Antioch. And so, as a faculty, we, uh, you know, we were concerned about this and, and felt like it was important to begin to address it on a curricular level, as well as supporting our, um, our colleagues in student life um, on campus. And so when we it headed into um, 2017, we were looking at an overall curriculum revision and took that opportunity to create a first year seminar course. We didn't have first year seminars prior to the fall of 2018. Um, and it designed, uh, it was a, a group of, a small group of faculty really across various disciplines. Um, Kevin, myself, um, one other colleague originally, and then we've had a number of other colleagues step in as instructors of the course. Um, but we, we volunteered to begin to design um, this course that, uh, again, we've titled Dialogue Across Difference. Um, in addition to that, to this course, starting in the fall of 2018, we've now introduced also a um, curricular requirement for all students to take at least one course in gender and sexuality studies and at least one course in critical um, race and ethnicity studies. Um, and Kevin was very instrumental. He was part of a, a small group working on a strategic plan for diversity at Antioch during that time. Um, and so this um, class also um, kind of fed into some of those goals, um, which um, Kevin can maybe mention a little bit more there. Um, so with our planning process, I just wanted to share a little bit about, about that. And then I'm just gonna pass it over to Kevin who will, um, talk more about the nuts and bolts of the class. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we were a small group of faculty across various disciplines who were really interested in this topic. So we had um, faculty members um, in, uh, again, Kevin is in history. Um, I have a background in, uh, in the arts, specifically community engagement in the arts. Um, uh, a, a colleague who was in performance and also psychology, 
um, among others now who have stepped in to teach the course. Um, and we invited a, a small group of faculty as well as some of our staff with relevant experience to join this working group that we created and designed a model around co-teaching the course, having two of us together in the classroom to model dialogue practices. And one of the things that we've continued to emphasize in the course is that we really want students to walk away with learning some skills feeling like it's a skill development course. Um, and so some of those skills, we really focus on active listening. Um, and part of that um, has brought about work around uh, mindfulness and being in the present moment and being able to um, uh, uh, approach active listening in a, in a practical sense. Um, and then moving the, uh, the class away from a model of kind of debate and discussion but into moving really into dialogue. And um, you know, many, many scholars have kind of looked at that, um, those differences there. Uh, and in a nutshell, it's kind of asking us, rather than having a model like debate that is based on an argument and where you're kind of arguing for your side or the winning side, um, or a certain side being right, versus the other side being wrong, that we're really trying to work in this class to move into away from that model that's quite competitive. Um, it can also um, generate a lot of conflict into a more collaborative process around creating common understandings as we listen to each other coming from diverse backgrounds and differences. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, a couple of the key sort of student learning outcomes that we really try and focus on in the course. Um, so we ask, you know, all students um, should be able to uh, identify and articulate the personal dimensions of social identities. Um, and so part of what we're looking at is intersectionality and students being able to look at their own positionality, their own social identities, um, and understanding those in, in the context of a larger um, socio-historical realm. Um, developing an understanding of the experiences of privileged and marginalized identities in personal, institutional, and systemic realms. Um, we're also asking students to apply skills of self-awareness and empathy so that that can really aid in um, intercultural dialogue and, and being able to have these conversations effectively. Um, we uh, are asking students to also explore their own curiosity and openness about complex topics um, and communicating effectively across differing points of views while preserving the humanity and the dignity of all people in the class. Um, so those are our learning outcomes for the class. Um, I'm gonna um, pass it over to my colleague, Kevin, to talk a little bit about some of our delivery models. Thank you, Louisa. I came to this course in part through my own research. Uh, as a historian, one of the areas that I focus on is race and real estate. And so I'm always thinking about how that plays out, particularly in the realm of housing. But then also from my personal experiences and uh, my experience being at, on the faculty at Antioch as one of the few Black faculty members, uh, as happens on many campuses, uh, students of color seek out faculty of color uh, beyond uh, scholarly needs. And so I was particularly aware of the distress that some of our students were in, the, the hazing that Louisa was describing was not an isolated thing. It happened, it seemed like every year there was something that happened and often women of color were the targets. Sometimes it were explicit events. Sometimes it was um, kind of passive aggressive kinds of things, but they were feeling unsafe. And out of that, uh, there was advocacy for us to create a strategic plan for diversity. And I was asked to co-chair that with Myler Cooper, who was then the director of the Coretta Scott King Center here at Antioch. And we completed that 
in the spring of 2016. And so that's kind of the context for the next year, we were asked to revise our curriculum. And that strategic plan had some goals that as we looked at revising the curriculum, uh, it did talk about, well, how do we see diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Antioch curriculum? And so that's kind of the backdrop for, for this course. Uh, as one of the people who's gonna be teaching it that first year, I have been part of the planning group. And then as I started thinking about how I was gonna teach it in the winter of 2019, I realized I did not have the background in mindfulness that one of our colleagues had or the background that Louisa has. And you know, as I sat alone putting together the syllabus, we had created kind of a master, master syllabus with some readings and those learning outcomes that Louisa just talked about. And I was picturing how this is gonna play out in the classroom and how comfortable I was with some of the things that we had talked about as a group. And I realized that I needed to, you know, find something that I could gravitate to my strengths in. And that's really how we looked at how this would be taught while we wanted some common learning outcomes, we all knew that we have different strengths. And so the first time I taught the class in the winter of 2019, I used the uh, nonviolent communication concept uh, that Marshall Rosenberg um, popularized as kind of the foundation and then overlaid that with readings about race, gender, sexuality, and nonviolent communication has a particular focus on empathy. Um, it intersects with mindfulness, but it's a little bit different. And his book kind of gave me the foundation to move forward in that, in that course. And then my own uh, knowledge in terms of history, uh, African-American history, urban institutions, I was able to bring that that into the classroom as well. And um, so that's what I did in the winter of 2019. Um, I got some really good feedback from the students in that class um, that some of them really gravitated to it and others felt that it was almost too neutral about the issues that they were dealing with. It mentions race, but it doesn't talk about how race can be a barrier in our communication. And, um, and, and so I, I would listen to what they were saying. And um, the next time that I taught it in the fall of 2020, I uh, used another uh, uh, template. And it's, um, it was based on, on this book, which is, um, called Race Dialogues, A Facilitator's Guide to Tackling the Elephant in the Classroom by Donna Rich Kaplowitz and Shaley Reese Griffin and Sherry Seika. And in, in finding that, I realized that um, one of the things we had not done a lot of at, at, in the planning group is drawing existing models. Um, and, and this book, is drawing on existing models in the field of intergroup dialogue. University of Michigan is one of the uh, colleges that has really done a lot of work in that area, and there are others as well. But um, I use this book, um, and then again, overlaid it. Its focus is on race, but some of our conflicts on campus, we, as you know, probably Antioch has a, a history of progressivism and um, there's an assumption that because we have that history, that that's automatically gonna happen with our students. And we're, you know, it's a new set of students. Antioch closed in 2007 and reopened. So technically we're even a different entity in the same buildings. 
Um, but, and we attract students from Ohio, California. And I think there's an, there was an assumption that all students are coming to Antioch to be radical. And a lot of students are just coming to Antioch because we're a small school, they want close connections. Um, we have good financial aid. And we had to realize that our students represent a range of identities, political points of view. And that helped us understand kind of the roots of what was happening in, in the classroom. And so these models of intergroup dialogue um, I, I would, I think that um, some people felt we don't need that, that's, but we were seeing as faculty supporting students that they were often, um, like I was saying, in distress. And so the intergroup dialogue concept, what it does is at the early part of the course, there are a lot of kind of ice breaking exercises where students who don't know each other are coming together and it takes them through exercises, including the instructor, where the instructor, I, I share things, I talked about my college experience and things that related to what they were talking about so that they wouldn't think I'm coming from on high <laughs> to proclaim. And then after you get through that, maybe first third of getting to know each other, then you move into conversations related to their own identity. And what I added onto that overlay was readings about um, uh, sexual uh, sexuality, um, the issues of heterosexism, gender, and, and then as they move into general discussions, the last about third of the course uh, in their template, they call it hot topics where students, you know, we survey them and ask, what topics do you want to talk about that you don't get a chance to talk about? And then I facilitated those discussions. And, um, you know, I, I felt the second time around that template worked, worked better for us than for me. <laughs> um, and then I think if we were look at lessons learned, some of them are you know, kind of individual, like I'm describing in terms of my experience. But some of them too are, you know, kind of curricular and related to faculty politics that um, there are faculty who come to Antioch since these decisions were made. And a lot of the people who were part of those decisions are no longer here. And so um, there are questions about what is the, uh, what is the usefulness of this course? And Luisa and I were talking about this, that we're in conversation among our colleagues. And I think the way that those conversations are going, there's, some, there's a need for some of the techniques that we're bringing to our students to bring to ourselves in terms of dialogue um, in that we, like our students, don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing our disagreements in a candid way that our colleagues can hear. And so rather than do that, um, sometimes process is used to move forward. And, and so we're, you know, that I would say is one of the lessons learned. Another is who should, who should be qualified to teach the class. Um, we have people who are coming from disciplines that are more related to kind of what this body, social sciences. <laughs> and, um, and I do think that some of them question um, the qualifications of others to teach this class. And, um, and so those, you know, I'm, I'm just being candid. Um, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> And um, well, and one other uh, element, we, we uh, suggested that the class be co-taught, but we've gone through uh, some faculty reductions. And so the ability to do that 
this has become more challenging. And so both times I taught it, I, I really pretty much taught it by myself. And, um, and so things like that are, are what we're looking at now as we look at continuing this course. And so I guess I'll stop there and be glad uh, to answer any questions uh, that you might have for Luisa and me. You're welcome to throw them in the chat, or also we can come back around to it after the others in the session present if people don't have any questions at, at this time. Um, we are continuing to offer the course. We're uh, typically teaching um, sections in both the fall and the winter to reach all of our incoming students, um, but there has been conversation, as Kevin mentioned, some of um, you know, some pressure on the institution of, you know, who, who is teaching, how many of these sections can we offer, um, and, and some, some um, questioning of whether or not we should maintain this class as being a required class for all incoming students, because it does set a certain uh, amount of um, kind of expectation and pressure on the teaching of it. Um, and those of us who, Kevin and I, um, come back and talk to each other quite a bit about the course and and still feel that it has it has improved campus climate and it has improved um, uh, many of our students ability to feel like they can tackle some more um, challenging conversations with each other. Um, the students have also suggested, why don't you teach it to all faculty and all staff? They should, that everybody on campus should take the class. And I think, I mean, I agree. I agree with our students' assessment of that. Um, whether or not we will have the institutional will to implement their suggestion is another question. <laughs> but. It's an intriguing challenge to ask what the, what the version of the course appropriate for uh, for faculty and staff colleagues might look like. So that's a neat note, I think, maybe to, to end on, and certainly we can loop back uh, later on. But uh, thank you very much, Louisa and, Ke and Kevin.